I can't stop thinking about this thing that happened. Every Sunday since I can remember, I go to my grandparents' house to have lunch. Usually, my aunt would take me, but I got my driver's license three weeks ago, so I have been driving myself there. I have been using my grandpa's old car. Their house is about 30 minutes away from where I live. They live in a kind of isolated place, so the drive there is very specific. Not a lot of cars, usually just people who live there walking around. Today, I was driving there. It was raining, and since it's the day after Christmas, there were barely any cars on the road. Then I saw this other car on the other side of the road. I didn't really think anything of it, but because I was driving alone, I took a look to make sure everything was all right, and I slowed down. Remember, I just got my license, so I'm being extra careful with everything. The first thing that I saw was that the car was exactly the same as mine, which is fine because it's a normal car to see around. It's not like it's super unusual. But then I looked at the driver and it was me. It was like I was looking at my own reflection. I immediately got chills and I had to stop the car down the road because I couldn't believe what I had just seen. I was stunned, in shock. I would swear that I saw myself driving my car. It was such a weird feeling. I don't know how to explain it. I guess it could have been a doppelganger, but the whole feeling I had from the encounter was just weird. Is there some kind of logical explanation to this? Or what? When I was in the fourth through eighth grade, we moved into a century old farmhouse in Straw Town, Indiana. My father was in and out of the picture at this point in my life. So most of the time it was just me, my mother and two younger brothers living there. One was only a year younger than I was and the youngest was zero to four during this time. The house always felt as though somebody was watching you or breathing down your neck. I'm just going to list things that occurred for brevity's sake. Number one, this happened to my mom. She started seeing this black shadow around the house. She said that she could smell him, like the body odor would be smelled in a specific spot, not directly next to it. As time went on, she started seeing the imprint of somebody sitting on the edge of her bed. Then one night, it laid across her legs, and she woke up thrashing trying to get it off. Number two. These things happened to me. I had the upstairs bedroom connected to the attic door through a small closet. These were huge rooms. Things were the least crazy for me. I would just hear footsteps run up and down the stairs at night, when my brothers would be in bed. The scariest thing that would happen to me was that often the door to the attic would swing open as though somebody had forced it and it would hit the wall. Then a cold presence would rush to my bedside. When I was 14, I started into a spiraling depression. I painted my walls blood red and I began to write poetry and things on my walls in this really aggressive handwriting. I have never felt or acted that way since. I have, however, had many instances of paranormal activity that have followed me throughout my life. Number three, one of my brothers had it bad. I only know fragments of his story, as what happened to him is something he'd rather forget. One night he was screaming in his room. We checked on him and he had been smacked across the face. We figured it was just him hitting himself in his sleep, but the handprint was upside down. It was impossible that he did it to himself. 15 years later, my mom told me that she found him crying on the stairs one night. He was reluctant to tell her why. But when pressed, he told her that he kept hearing voices, telling him to kill all of us. My mom understandably kept this from us. When I asked him about it, he was visibly upset and said that it stopped as soon as we moved from the house and he didn't want to talk about it. 
My youngest brother was two to three when he started saying weird stuff. He would talk about the boots walking around the house with no body attached. He'd also hear laughing whenever he would get near the basement steps. I remember the four of us kneeling and praying that this entity would leave us alone, but it didn't. We decided to leave after a morning when my mom and youngest brother were home alone. They were taking a nap. When the bed and dresser started violently shaking, there was no earthquake and no reason for it. They shook by themselves, and my mom described it as feeling as though she was being intimidated. We moved out. We were told by a neighbor that everybody that's ever moved into that house has moved out within a few months. It's empty now. I still drive by it, and I want to go confront whatever's there and get answers. The landlord is an old farmer that doesn't believe us. This has been the first time I've ever talked about it, really, at least publicly. Since I've moved on with my life, I've lived in several different houses. I've heard strange noises of objects moving in other rooms and deliberate knocking. Not super frequently, though. In one house, we had a painting of Delight Yourself in the Name of the Lord up in the dining room. We heard this crash one night and found it five feet to the right, blocking the bathroom entrance. We also could hear razors and shampoo bottles being tossed in the bathroom at that house. In another, I had two friends over playing poker in the kitchen. And as we were talking about a shelf that had come off the wall the night before, a plastic blender cup was chucked out of the pantry behind us and bounced off that exact wall. I don't know if something followed me from that house or if it's related at all, but it's been interesting. When my niece was really young, she was in a bouncer at my sister's house. I was house and babysitting. I had left her to go to the kitchen to grab some water. My sister's chocolate labs were probably sniffing and licking her head because I could hear her giggling like she was having a blast. I hadn't noticed how cold it had gotten. And then I heard it. A loud wooden snap like a thick piece of wood had been snapped in half suddenly or a tree was knocked over. I ran into the room and what I saw and smelled freaked me out. The dogs were huddled in the corner whimpering. My niece was just staring at the ceiling corner with wide eyes and it was cold and smelled like Stetson. I took her and we decided to go to a different room. When my sister finally came home, I told her what happened. She just rolled her eyes and said, Oh, that's just Hugh. I was so confused. She said that Hugh was the previous owner of the house who had died ten years before his wife sold it. She said he likes to follow my niece around, and you can tell it's him because the dogs freak out, it gets cold, and it smells like cheap cologne. I don't believe in that shit, but I do believe that feeling you get in your gut when something just doesn't feel right. This is one of my many experiences at St. Thomas Church. This one was about eight years ago. Probably not that scary compared to other things that I've experienced, but it was the first one that popped into my head. I went to a graveyard that had a church with four of my friends. One of my friends knew about it as he had come once before. The rest of us had never been. Now, my intention was to go there to see if I could genuinely talk to any spirits because of past experiences. Two of my friends, however, were the usual let's have a laugh and mock the dead type, while the other two were shitting themselves, as you do. We walked around for about 15 minutes and I was asking questions like, is anyone here that wants to talk? But it was hard with my two friends acting like idiots. So I just thought, Okay, this is silly. I'll just stop. Now, just to be clear, two of the cars we took were right next to each other, 
about half a meter apart, with the big gates to the right of the cars, which is where you enter straight into the graveyard. We walked back to the cars, and I leaned against one car, and one friend next to me, on my left, and the other three leaned against the other car. Now we're all facing each other, just talking, when suddenly from the right of us, we hear this voice, almost like a child's voice, say, help me. I am not kidding. My friends and I all looked right in the same direction at the same time. All of our heads just turned, and we all went silent, giving each other that look like, what's going on? I said quietly to all of them, you heard that, right? Their faces said it all. Then about 30 seconds later, we heard it again. Help me. But it was a little bit fainter. My friends started to panic, and I was a little scared, but more curious. They opened their car door so fast it wasn't funny. I don't blame them. I hopped in the back of my mate's car, the one that I was leaning on, and her car wouldn't start straight away. I looked out the window, and my two mates in the other car had already sped off. I was trying to calm my friends down, who I was in the car with, but after about a minute the car started, and my friend who was driving sped off screaming, I'm never coming back here again, while my friend in the passenger seat agreed. When we were off the road that leads to the graveyard, she slowed down, and I pulled my phone out to see if I could find anything about this graveyard, as I had never been before. I found out that there were two young twin brothers who used to play around there at the church and attend with their family. One day they were playing and tried to play a prank. Something went wrong and they both caught fire and burned to death. I swear that voice we heard sounded exactly like a young boy's voice. It creeped me out. I told my friends and they agreed. They also said that they would never go back there and I can't blame them. Personally, I've been back four times now, and something has happened every time. This is another story from my friend, the church custodian, and from the church that we both attend. My friend David and I were at his graduation party, and we were telling one of his other friends about some of the strange things that go on at our church. David's friend didn't really believe the stories, so we decided to take him to the church that night when we knew that nobody else would be there. We get to the church around 9 p.m., unlock the doors, and go in. All the lights are off, so we're going room to room, turning them on as we go. Almost immediately, we all hear footsteps on the floor above us. We finish going through the first floor, and as we're ascending the stairs, we hear the footsteps come to the top of the stairs, which is around a landing halfway up the staircase. In the window on the landing, we can clearly see an outline of what looks like a person. At this point, our friend had decided that he'd gotten enough proof to believe our stories and was ready to leave. We're standing in the parking lot, facing the door, arguing over who's going to have to go back in and turn all the lights off, when all of a sudden there are three very distinct taps on the nursery window. The nursery is on the second floor, and on the side of the building that we were facing. That made the decision about turning the lights out a little bit harder. Fun fact about the nursery. Once we got back to David's house, we were telling his mom, who's the actual custodian for the church, about what had happened. And she told us that she hated having to go into the nursery while she was alone due to the feelings she got in there. She also said that the old wooden rocking chair that was in there would almost always be rocking when she went in to clean. So she would go clean something else and wait for whoever was in the rocking chair to finish up.
When I was in high school in the 80s, there was this story about a local church in the country, long abandoned, that there were satanic gatherings every Sunday at midnight. The front door was painted red. There was a long dirt drive to the right of the church that led to an abandoned farmhouse. Legend had it that the farmer had killed his entire family one night. So an old stone church, no parking lot, cemetery directly in front of the church, and the dirt path on the right leading to the farm three miles away, on an unlit blacktop five miles away from any houses or main roads. I was 17 and my friends were 18. It was the summer after graduation. My friend Darla and I were driving around with her annoying friend Betsy who was sitting in the back seat. I was driving Darla's car and she was the passenger. It was around 11.30 p.m. when Darla and I decided that we should drive to the church just to see if the stories were true. Betsy freaked out in the back seat the entire way and being young and immature, I wanted to either smack her or laugh the entire way there. Around 11.50, I pulled up and decided to scare Betsy by pulling onto the dirt lane. I was about a quarter of a mile in. Betsy freaked out. I was laughing. Darla was high. Two minutes later, I kid you not, a station wagon pulls into the drive behind us. At 11.53, on a Sunday night, it was two elderly people, around 80 years old, dressed in their Sunday best, both frail and white-haired. They stayed, and we discussed. Betsy said, oh my gosh, get us out of here. I said, there's no way out except backward. I wasn't going any further down the drive, and there was a cemetery to my left, a stone church at the upper left, and a thatch of trees to my right. We were effectively trapped. Darla said, do you think they're devil worshippers? No, I said, they're too old. Betsy screamed, haven't you seen Rosemary's baby? They were old. I'm trying to stay calm when another car pulls behind the station wagon. It's now 11.57 p.m. It's a brown Dodge. A young kid gets out, walks up to the old couple, and talks to them for a while. Okay, they know each other. Now I'm getting freaked out. I call out to the old man, can you please back up? Can you ask the guy behind you two? We'd like to leave. Thank you. Darla says the kid came to my window and threatened to stab me with a knife that he showed me. I don't remember that. The old man unleashed a torrent of curse words that I still don't understand. He called me all kinds of derogatory names, everything you can think of telling me he didn't know the kid, so he couldn't be rude and ask the guy to move. His wife just sat there. I yelled, yes, you do know him. He just walked up to your car and talked to you. Then, suddenly, they both left. I peeled out and took off down the road. I didn't see their cars or lights, and it's a fairly straight road. 20 seconds later, the kid jumps out of the bushes on the side of the road, right in front of the car. We screamed, I swerved, and we never went there again. Looking back, Darla and I must have been traumatized. I don't remember peeling backwards and getting us out of there. She doesn't remember the kid jumping in front of my car, and I don't remember the kid coming to my window with a knife. But between all of us in the car, we put the story together. Needless to say, it was the most bizarre and scary moment of my life. This is my experience from Jekyll Island Beach Club, a hotel that I now know is quite infamous for being haunted and frequented by ghost hunters. I've lived in Georgia my entire life. We traveled all around the state growing up, going to conferences that my mother attended for her job. I was around nine years old on this particular trip, so it was about 2003. It was just me, my father, and my mother. We still like to share these stories at family gatherings, 
and I figured that somebody else might appreciate them too. I will preface this by saying that I was an extremely independent and resourceful child, so my parents let me do my thing on these types of trips and make friends with the other kids also in attendance. So don't get your panties in a bunch about me being left alone in the hotel room for a couple of hours or being allowed to run around the resort with my buds. When we arrived at the hotel, our room immediately creeped us out. Upon opening the door, there was a staircase leading up to our suite. It was spacious, with a dining room, king-sized bed, and wall partially separating the bedroom from a living room area with a pull-out couch. We were just chilling, exhausted from our drive, when we heard the sound of a door creaking open. We looked to our right, and the door to what we assumed was the closet was ajar. It wasn't a closet. It was a brick wall. My family and I are Diet Coke fanatics. I used to pound them, even if they were room temperature. Disgusting, I know. After the door incident, I figured I needed a little caffeine, so I went to open a Diet Coke from a 12-pack that we'd bought coming in. Completely flat. Well, that's weird. I tried to open another. Completely flat. Curious. The next day, we tried to open one from the 12-pack we'd left in the car, and it was totally fine. Something had been draining the energy, in this case I guess the carbonation, from all of our belongings. My mom had a sweet blackberry at the time. I used to play that little game where you bounce the ball off that little bar that goes back and forth. You know what I'm talking about. Her blackberry had been charging since we got there and was all the way charged. After the door and the unsuccessful attempt at having a Diet Coke, I figured I would just play a little of that game. I unplugged it, plopped down on the couch, and as soon as I opened the damn game, I watched the battery completely drain and die. No electronics that we brought on that trip would hold a charge. Everything would die as soon as we came into the suite. Later on, sunburned and reminiscing on my day boogie boarding, my parents left me in the suite to go hit up the conference's reception. I whipped out my markers and started drawing when I heard the toilet, which was on the other side of the wall separating my pull-out couch from the master, flush. All right, that's weird. I decided to lay in my parents' bed and watch the toilet to see what the hell was going on. About 15 minutes later, I watched, wide-eyed, as the handle on the toilet went down and it happened again. My nine-year-old brain was trying to make logical sense of this. I was freaked out, but not frightened. I do believe to this day that they were friendly ghosts. I decided to migrate back to my pull-out bed. Another 30 minutes go by and I've chalked it up to being nothing. And then it does it again, followed by the laughter of what sounded like children my age. I rolled over and covered my head until my parents got back. The next night, I was on my pull-out bed playing possum and pretending to sleep whilst pondering all the strange shit that had gone down. It was about 11.30 p.m. That's when I started hearing footsteps above us. It sounded like several people were running above the room. Problem was, we were on the top floor. My parents, who think I'm asleep, start freaking out and whispering, Holy shit! Back and forth. Then, there was a knock at our door. My dad yelps and my mom bursts out laughing at his reaction. They go down the staircase together to answer the door like two teenagers. They still think I'm asleep. It was a hotel security dude who says, We've received several complaints about kids playing up here. Can you please tell your children to keep it down as our guests are trying to sleep? My parents respond with, We only have one kid and she's asleep upstairs. He responds with, Oh. Listen, I'm going to be honest, I can't say this is the first time something like this has happened. The next day, my mom was in some workshops, and I wanted to hit up the pool and chill with some of my friends. The same group of kids always showed up to these conferences. Our parents are all judges, senators, legislators, or lobbyists. While I was at the pool, my dad decided to play a round of golf. At one point, I tried to go back to the room real quick to get something. I whipped out my room key, which was a literal key, but I couldn't get the door open. I went to the front desk and an employee walked me back to the room to try to let me in. It turned out the deadbolt, the ones in hotel rooms that can only be locked from the inside, had somehow been placed. 
Not exaggerating, they ended up having to take the door off the hinges so my family and I could get back in. Up until this point, all of these occurrences were just weird, and none of them were particularly frightening. There were only two days left of the trip. I fell asleep that night with no issue, but I woke up to what felt like somebody was getting onto the pull-out bed. I thought it was just my mom or dad, so I rolled over. But no one was there. Alright, now I'm actually feeling trepidation. I slam my eyes shut, but I have a distinct feeling that somebody is watching me. I laid motionless for probably an hour, afraid to move or call out to my parents, who were asleep on the other side of the wall. Then, a loud bang. One of those noises that jolts you and reflexively forces your eyes open. There was a tall figure, probably at least eight feet, at the foot of my bed in a black hood. I couldn't see its face. I started screaming and hid under the covers. My parents rushed over, comforting me as I'm crying and terrified. We then all three heard a laugh, this time of an adult, followed by loud footsteps overhead. I was done after this, and so were my parents. We packed up our stuff and left in the middle of the night, and my mom missed the last day of the conference. I still see some of the friends that I made on those trips, and they all have their own stories from that particular conference at Jekyll Island Beach Club. One of them, a judge's son, had lucked out and gotten to stay out in the lighthouse suite. He and his father had taken us to see it, and it was incredible. Spiral staircase leading up to the top where the actual suite was. His stories of our time spent at the resort are the most terrifying. Needless to say, I will never go back. My mom recently had a conference there and refused to stay on the resort grounds, opting to stay at another hotel down the road. I had a pretty weird experience at the Hilton Garden Inn in Jackson, Mississippi formerly the King Edward Hotel. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this place being haunted or had an experience there themselves. I've looked online and I can't seem to find anything. It was built in 1923, closed in 1967, vacant for almost 40 years, and reopened in 2009, but that's about it. Anyway, my partner and I stayed here a couple of nights ago, just passing through on a road trip home. My partner is not a believer in the spiritual or paranormal realm. In the morning, he woke me up at 5 a.m. wanting to leave immediately. He's been sick during our vacation, so I thought that maybe he was just feeling crappy and wanted to get an early start on the rest of our trip, so we leave. After about 30 minutes on the road, he says, I want to tell you something, but I don't want to talk about it anymore after I tell you. We can talk about it later. I agree and he tells me that something was in the room with us that night. Something, not someone. He said that our pup was staring right at it and wasn't barking. I got full body chills and a huge lump in my throat when he told me. It freaked me out so much because he doesn't believe in these things, and he just looked beyond terrified when he told me. We haven't talked about it again yet. Does anyone else have any experiences there? This is just a little story in case anybody is interested. I work in a medical lab in a series of hospitals, and lately I've been working in one that has a senior's home attached. One wing is for seniors who are in their right minds and just can't look after themselves anymore, wheelchair bound, things like that. The other wing is for seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's, and so on. Usually when I drive into work, at least once a month, the flag out front is at half mast meaning that one of the seniors has passed away. The medical lab in this hospital has a small waiting area outside, and the rooms in the lab are in an L shape. The smaller part is the blood collection room, and the longer is the actual lab with the machinery and so on. The door leading from the collection room to the lab is at the junction of where the long side and short side of the L meet. 
and this is also the entrance from the waiting room to the collection room. I hope you're not confused, but it's the best way I know how to describe it. One morning, I was working by myself. The other tech was out doing x-rays, and as I stepped from the lab to the waiting room, out of the corner of my left eye, I saw a man standing at the door. He was wearing an old jacket, a baseball cap, and jeans. Very normal wear for older men in this area. As I was moving from one foot to the other, I assumed he was waiting for blood work, so I turned to ask him, but when I went to face him, there was no one there. I laughed it off, assuming that I had just seen things, went to my computer, sat down, and did some work. When it was time to go back into the lab and unload the centrifuge, I passed the open door and now saw the same man in the same place out of the corner of my right eye. Again, I turned, and again, there was no one. At this point, I was getting a little weirded out, leaving the lab to walk back into the collection room, passing the open door. I went more slowly this time, and yes, holy crap, he was still there, now seen out of the corner of my left eye, just like the first time. While I do believe in spirits and the like, I always believe that 90% of the time there's a perfectly normal explanation for everything. There's a potted plant in my house. If you see it from the corner of your eye, it looks like there's a big shaggy dog there. We've never had a big shaggy dog, and our house was built on that land, so I know that there aren't any shaggy dog ghosts going around. It's just how your eye sees things and your brain interprets them. But at this point, I'm starting to get even more freaked out. A part of me wants to see if I can contact him, and a part of me just wants him to go away. About ten minutes later, the other tech has returned. As she is walking from the collection room to the lab, she stops and gives me a start. She looks back at me and laughs and says, oh, I just thought I saw an old man sitting in the chairs there. I looked at her and simply said, I've been seeing him all morning. Are you serious? She asked. Very. I said. We never saw him again, but the next day, we learned that one of our seniors had died that afternoon. I guess it was either someone who had passed and was lost, or he was waiting for the other senior. Either way, I won't be forgetting that experience for a while. So, my friends and I visited this abandoned place in Slovakia. The asylum was first opened in 1918 as a spa center. Later, it was rebuilt as an asylum and closed in the 1970s. It is said that patients were tortured here, and many experiments were done on them. So I took a lot of pictures and recorded about 15 minutes of videos. We've experienced strange sounds. Something made a lot of noise, but we didn't make anything of it at first. After the noise, we said, do that again if you're here, but nothing happened. But then as we were leaving, something made a noise behind me, and my friend said he could feel a cold touch on his back. So we finally left the place and looked at the photos. There's something on the photos that I need to debunk, or not. I enhanced the photos already, so you can see better. The links will be in the description. I'd love to hear your opinions about them. I don't know what we saw, but I'd love to debunk it or confirm what it is. A friend of mine worked in a hospital. She called me up one day to talk about strange things that were happening. She worked night security, and during this time, an older part of the hospital was being renovated. She would notice things, like the sound of someone walking behind her, equipment being moved around, the doors opening and closing, doors to patient rooms would jerk open, 
She was getting scared and asked me to come with her one night. I got permission to walk with her. I saw the doors open and close, and I even heard someone talking in one of the patient rooms. This side of the hospital was closed off. She, I, and one other security guard were the only people there that night. I took a ton of photos and videos. On one of the videos, you can hear footsteps. And, on one video, you could see a door creak open a bit, all on its own. All of that was alright, but this scared the hell out of me. During one of the videos, I could plainly see a figure of a woman walk out from a room. She stood next to the nurse's desk. It was very quick. I was moving my phone from side to side. I didn't see her with my naked eyes, so I didn't know to pause. She had a bluish tint to her. She had a jacket, a skirt, and kind of a beehive hairdo, and glasses. My friend showed the picture to some of the nurses. A few of the older nurses said it looked like a girl who used to work there and also died at the hospital. One nurse jumped up. Oh my gosh, that looks just like Maggie. She said that Maggie worked in the hospital in the early 70s and died there from cancer. I wish I still had the pictures and the videos, but my phone was stolen before I could upload them. But my phone was stolen before I could get all the footage off. Either way, it was a pretty terrifying experience, but kind of cool, too. This happened to my mother, who had been admitted to hospital in the summer of 2018, after she was suffering from pain in her abdomen caused by ulcers in her stomach, which were later removed. In her ward, there was one other patient, a very elderly lady, who seemed to be out of it, to be perfectly honest. Her ward had four hospital beds, two beds facing the other two beds across the room, with two windows to the far side. One night, my mother remembers a chair, which was used by visitors of the patients being opposite her bed, she awoke the next morning to find that exact chair right by her bedside, as if somebody had visited her in the night and left it there in its position. Even if it was a doctor checking up on her, they wouldn't sit down on the chair or leave it there in that position. My grandfather passed away in 1994 and didn't get to see any of his grandchildren. I wonder sometimes, was this my grandfather showing a sign? I live in Madagascar, that island on the east of Africa. A lot of people here still believe in magic, sorcery, and all that stuff despite being a largely Christian country. My dad died in 2002, and he lived and experienced a lot of things in his life. He was a Christian and did not believe in witchcraft and magic, although he experienced a very strange thing back in the 80s. My mom and an aunt confirmed this story. In 1985, even before I was born, my dad caught pneumonia and was rushed to the hospital. My mom and an auntie were there to look after him, buying meds and stuff like that. My uncle, that aunt's husband, knew things about black magic and traditional Malagasy witchcraft. When he once visited my dad on the fourth or fifth day in the hospital, he told him something. He gave him a piece of ginger and asked him to keep it in his hand for the next two days. My dad asked why and my uncle told him that on the next two days, an evil person who wanted to hurt him would come to visit him in the hospital. Holding that piece of ginger would keep the evil person away. My dad did not believe a single word of what he said, 
but my mom insisted he do it out of respect because she knew my uncle was really serious about it. So my dad kept the ginger in his hand for two days. The very next day, while he and my mom were in the room, someone knocked at the door. My mom opened it and one of my dad's co-workers and a friend was there with some flowers. My mom told him to enter, but the guy stayed right there. And finally he said that he just would not enter the room. My dad saw him and told him to come in, but he was standing in the threshold, looking like he wanted to move, but couldn't come over the threshold. Finally, he just turned back and walked away quickly without even saying goodbye. Later, when my dad was back to work, his coworker and friend wasn't working there anymore, and my dad never saw him again. I'm not really sure what I'm looking for by telling this story, but I feel the need to share it. In my hometown in South Texas, there is a hospital that is abandoned. It has an extremely demonic presence. I've had friends who have gone inside and ventured down to the basement level. There, they've heard growling and seen glowing red eyes. That was eight or nine years ago. My little brother, who's 17, has had friends go into the basement there and encountered the same thing. It's also sprawling. The stairs that leave the basement are an entirely different spot than where they entered. At night, if you get close, it feels like your heart is being tightly clenched. It's hard to catch your breath. It's like something is sucking the air out of your lungs. The feeling of despair and panic just engulfs you. You just feel the need to get away from there as soon as possible. And that's just coming into the parking lot at night after around 8 p.m. I haven't ventured inside, but the feelings I described are what I have felt along with my wife. The presence is intense and extremely powerful. My wife is something of an oculus. She said that she saw an old lady shift and take the form of a young child, dragging a dirty, ragged teddy bear with a murderous smile and black eyes. I have deemed the building and the property a no-go after sundown. I work at a small 48-bed hospital. These experiences happen in or near the decommissioned psych wing. IT, in which I work, was moved to this wing, into old patient rooms. At first, I'd hear my name called, often from down the hall or from empty rooms. Thinking someone needed tech support, I would try to locate the caller, but there was never anyone there. Many times I would see people in empty rooms, a patient on a bed, a doctor in a white lab coat next to them. As this was a decommissioned wing, it made me turn around to investigate, only to find the rooms empty. Frequently, there was a male and a female walking together, apparently talking to each other, and they would turn into the room next to mine. I would follow them, only to find that they had entered a room through a closed door and no one was inside. It was always the same room, too. One afternoon, on a Saturday, I got called in while my four-year-old daughter and I were downtown. I headed over, but was unable to unlock the notoriously problematic back door to our wing. However, I saw a man coming down the hallway toward me, and I knocked on the door and motioned that I was locked out. He appeared to look right at me, but instead of coming to my aid, made a right-hand turn into the office next to mine. I quickly leaned forward to better see, and hurriedly knocked on the door, thinking he hadn't seen or heard me. 
only to realize the door to that office was closed. Confused, I thought maybe I had just seen a reflection in the window from behind me, and turned, asked my daughter if anyone had walked up behind us, and she said no. I was able to get the door open finally, and the office was empty. Another time, our wing was fully occupied due to a remodel which displaced some staff. I heard what I thought was a metal cart coming down the hall, and then a tremendous crash like a dozen pots and pans hitting a tile floor. I jumped up and ran into the hallway, partly to assist, and partly to make sure nobody was hurt. No one on our floor had heard anything. There was no cart, and no disaster. Next, I was called in on New Year's Eve, before midnight. The issue took about 20 minutes to resolve, and since I was going to miss the festivities anyway, I thought I would document my time and head home. Upon entering my office, I noticed the bathroom door was open several inches, which I always keep closed. This wasn't a big deal. Housekeeping had probably left it open while cleaning up. For some reason, I did not close it as I normally would have during the day. As I typed up the incident, a man exited my bathroom. At first I thought perhaps my boss had come to investigate as well, but then why would he have been in my office? As I looked up, the man, just over six feet tall and thin, looked over at me in shock, as I must have been doing to him, and then he disappeared. Considering the hour, I noped out of there without finishing my report. The old TVs in the rooms of this wing would sometimes turn on by themselves, just static, as they had no feeds, but I had to unlock empty patient rooms and turn off the televisions occasionally, always with the volume turned up to the max. One other co-worker has told me that he has heard his name called when no one is there, has seen the woman walking down the hall but without the man, and the doctor by the bedside, but that's all. Many people will report hearing things they can't explain, but no one else has told me that they can see anything. The rest of the hospital has no abnormal activity that we know of. For years, my mom worked in a hospital that had been abandoned and recently torn down. She worked there for a long time, and it's the reason that she believes in the paranormal. Nothing too scary happened to her, but the events definitely stuck, because they're always her go-to ghost stories when reconnecting with past co-workers. The first one is one night while cleaning. She was organizing papers in what they called the kitty psych. It wasn't necessarily used as a psych ward, just where they put the kids so that they weren't near the actual ward for inmates. Only her and another nurse were on that floor, and she could hear her in the kitchen doing dishes. Mom was in a small room, so there was no way that she would not have seen somebody enter. She felt the heaviness of a person walking past, and knew that it wasn't the other nurse because, as I said, she could still hear her in the kitchen. The second incident has a little backstory. When the original owner fell ill, she was in a hospital room in her own hospital and had to pass ownership to her sons. She was unhappy with a lot of what they did to her hospital and sadly passed knowing that the building she loved so much was going to go to crap. Well, when she passed, the door to her hospital room would slam repeatedly any time her sons made a decision she didn't like. It went from being terrifying to sort of a joke. When the door would slam, you'd almost always hear a nurse respond with, Mama Mansoor is unhappy with her boys. You could also hear people running in the wards, despite the doors being heavy and unable to be opened without a key. You could stand in the hall and feel the heaviness of people running around you. Maybe not the scariest, 
but everybody I know loves hearing my mom's haunted hospital stories, so I figured I would share them with you. This happened with my mom when she gave birth to my young sister. She was at the hospital sharing the room with another woman and her newborn. My mom was placed at the side near the washroom. So two days after giving birth, my mom was sleeping and it was pretty late, 1 a.m. to be precise. She was woken up by a nurse who had curly hair tied back, well-defined features, she gave my mom an immediate negative vibe, those feelings where you just know something is wrong. The nurse started asking my mom to get up and come with her. She told her this repeatedly. My mom felt the air change and instantly knew this was not a nurse. She held on to the rods of the bed, started praying and shook her head, rebelling at the request. The nurse then looked at my mom gave her a huge creepy smile, laughed, pinched her, and then disappeared into thin air. My mom was super paranoid the whole night. Since each ward has their own group of nurses, my mom was well aware who was her appointed nurse. She instantly knew that that nurse didn't belong there. My mom spent the whole night praying, the next morning she convinced my dad that no matter what she was not going to spend another night there. Usually, C-section mothers wouldn't be discharged there after the third day, but my mom got herself discharged on the third day. Over the years I've thought about it, I thought it was probably just the results of medication or something. But my mom swears to have felt each moment as real as it could be. Also, my mom is quite sensitive to these entities, or jinn. She can always sense their presence and has had her share of experiences with the paranormal side, which makes me think that maybe she did in fact encounter something strange that night. About a year ago, my girlfriend at the time and I, now fiancé, decided to visit an old abandoned sanatorium, which is now a state park. It was a facility from the 1930s, developed for the treatment of tuberculosis patients, and eventually patients with mental illnesses. In the 70s, cases of abuse and an unusual increase in death rate led to the closing of the facility in the 1990s. Today, it's open to the public and considered to be a beautiful place for seaside recreation. The grounds are well kept, and people are free to walk around. The structure itself is abandoned and off limits to the public. My fiancé loves abandoned places, and as we walked the perimeter of the fence surrounding the building, we were both taking pictures with our phones. As we reached the other side from where we'd begun, my fiancé's phone began to shut off or reset itself whenever she attempted to take a picture from that side of the building. My phone was still working just fine, but hers shut off about four times in a row before she was ever able to get the picture she wanted. She eventually gave up and we kept walking. As we circled back to where we'd begun, she noticed her phone was working again. She'd had no prior issues with the phone, and hasn't since. We believe that something did not want its picture taken, or somehow interfered with her phone. It was pretty creepy. A couple of years back, I was struggling, and constantly in and out of mental hospitals. 
Don't let this make you question my credibility, though. It was just for depression and anxiety stuff. I was never prone to hallucinations or anything like that. But anyway, I was in a hospital that was really, really old. Used to be a farm like a hundred years ago. My roommate decided to make a makeshift Ouija board with a piece of paper and a bottle cap. I was like 15 and didn't believe in ghosts or anything, so I went with it, thinking that nothing would happen. I was very wrong. So the two of us sat in our room and we were asking questions. I had had some odd and possibly supernatural experiences at this hospital before, but I still didn't believe before this happened. I was getting exasperated and I told my roommate to stop messing around and stop moving the bottle cap. Well, she took her hands off, so I was the only one with my hands on it. Then I asked another question. The cap shook a little, but I thought it was just me, because my hands shook. Then I asked a question, and the cap started shooting around and went off the paper. It was just going nuts. Needless to say, I said goodbye. I was completely shocked, and I've been a believer ever since. So I was working at this hospital called Warren General in Warren, Pennsylvania about 90 minutes east of Erie. I worked the night shift. I'm a travel RN, so this was one of the hospitals that I traveled to. One night, my floor was so slow that I got pulled down to the CCU to work. Well, that night, my patient rang her call bell at 3 o'clock in the morning. She asked me, what does she want? I said, what do you mean? She said, the nurse that keeps coming in here and standing there in that corner. She pointed to the corner behind the door. I said, who? Ashley? The nurse that I was working with, and I pointed to her, sitting in the nurse's station. She says, no, the other one. Well, there was no other one. It was just the two of us. The patient was a woman in her fifties with no history of mental illness and she wasn't taking any medication that would make her hallucinate. So I kind of laughed and I said, it's just us. She just stares at me, so I say, okay, well if she does it again, just yell for me and I'll come right in. Her room was eight feet in front of the nurse's station. So about a half hour goes by and she yells, see, there you go again. I got up, started walking, and I heard the bathroom door shut. It had been cracked open just a little bit to give her dark room a little bit of light. I walked in and I said, see, you're dreaming, no one else is here. She says, no, she's here. She went into the bathroom. So I opened the door, light still on, and there's no one there. Looking confused, I say, um, well, what does she look like? I thought maybe somebody was messing around. It's too dark to tell. I can tell it's a woman, but she's so dark I can't really make out her face. So when she says that, I get a little weirded out, but the night ends and I forget about it. Three months go by. I get pulled back down to the same unit. I have the same room as before. This time, it's a man in his early 60s. He's a nice guy, alert, oriented, and very polite. The night's going really well. It's about 3 a.m. and his call light goes off, which of course means that he needs something. So I walk in and he says, you are my nurse, right? And I shook my head yes. He said, well then why does that lady keep coming in here and standing in the corner? What is she doing? What? I almost shit myself instantly. This was three months later in the same room the same thing. I said to him, honestly, I think it's a ghost, sir. 
and he laughs. I said, no, really, you're not the first one to say that. I started telling everybody about it then, and I found out that the entire second floor has a nurse that's seen every once in a while. I guess in the 1990s, a nurse who worked up there killed herself. In fact, she shot herself in the second floor bathroom. Everything that will be written here is true. It could be misinterpreted, but I'll explain everything as it is. I'm 21. When the events that I will tell you here happened, I was around 15 or 16. I was fascinated by abandoned buildings at that time, and the first one that I found that was close to my house was an abandoned hospital. This hospital was firstly built in the early 1900s as a sanatorium, then was bought in the late 1980s by the regional hospital to become a palliative care center. My first visit was the one that started all of the curiosity that I had about this place. In the beginning of the summer, I came to this three-floor hospital. Our first goal was to take pictures of this beautifully decayed place. Everything was fine, until we arrived on the third floor. My friend suddenly started to panic, and, being a bit aggressive, yelled, Let me go out! Let me go out! I first thought that he was doing a joke, but he looked really scared of something. Since I didn't want to leave, I accompanied my friend outside, and then came back inside, alone. I wanted to take pictures of the empty corridors of the third floor. The weird thing is that when I asked him about this a few minutes later, he didn't remember being aggressive or scared. All he knew was that we went outside together and I went back in. I didn't have any particular feeling about the place during the visit. I was just excited because it was my first time in an abandoned building. My second visit was with a different friend. I didn't tell her anything that happened during the last visit. Like the last time, things started to become weird when we arrived on the third floor. I started to feel a little bad, like something was preventing me from breathing correctly. My friend told me a few minutes later that she was having the same weird feeling. We felt scared and didn't want to continue with this oppressive sensation so we left. The third time, I went to the hospital with a camcorder. I probably did the worst thing ever. Before our second visit together, we watched some paranormal videos on YouTube, and we wanted to get some answers about the third floor. During the whole visit, we asked some questions to the supposed entities that lived in the hospital. We got what we interpreted as an answer in the basement. Since our last visit, things were moved and destroyed, probably by vandals. I asked, did you move anything here? On the video, I could clearly hear, it's not us. The other voice that I recorded was in the church part of the sanatorium. It happened just at the moment we were leaving, a voice whispering, it's the death. The last thing we did this day was to go to one room of the third floor and ask multiple questions and wait for answers while recording everything with a voice recorder, trying to get EVPs. After a few minutes, we saw a shadow moving really fast, and we heard what sounded like heavy footsteps running on broken glass just behind us in the dead end corridor. I immediately ran to the direction of the noise. My friend and I looked everywhere in the hospital, but nobody was there. We ran out and left the area, promising that we would not try to get in contact with those entities again. The following night, I had sleep paralysis, and I don't often experience that. There was a black silhouette staring at me in front of my bed. 
This might have been a coincidence, but it was quite weird that it happened just after this scary episode. After all those experiences, I returned to the hospital alone after that. A few times, actually. Sometimes, I didn't have any bad feeling in any part of the hospital, and was able to capture every picture that I wanted. Some other times, I had the feeling that I was not welcomed, was oppressed, and didn't have the courage to take the pictures that I had initially planned. As I told you, I was 15 or 16 when all of this happened. Now the building is sold and under security. If I had the same experience today, my judgment about the events would probably be different. My theory is the following. The voices we heard on the recordings were probably interpreted because we wanted them to be there. My friend's behavior in the third floor could have just been a strong case of panic. The bad feeling that I had on this floor might be because of the memories of my friend's reaction. My friend having the same feeling that I did is a little weirder. I first thought about something in the air like asbestos, dust, or cracked paint, maybe even mold. But this theory doesn't work, as it was not happening every time I went there. The noises of the person running on cracked glass is still impossible for me to explain. Where did this person or animal go if it was one? All the rooms were opened. The noise was behind us in a dead-end corridor. We saw nobody running, and the noise only lasted a few seconds. What was that shadow behind us then? It wasn't ours. The sleep paralysis that I had after that, maybe it was just sleep paralysis. But maybe it was more. What do you think? Do you think that we encountered something that day? Today, my mom told me a story that happened in December of 2019. She works at a hospital. I found her story quite unsettling. Just for backstory, I'm from Catalonia, Spain. My mom is a doctor who works in a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illnesses and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition. No gas leaks or anything like that. So her story went like this. She has a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographies done. Everything goes on as usual, and when they're done, my mom goes to an adjacent room's computer, room N4, where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her. No more than 30 seconds later, she hears the doorknob turning violently, as if somebody is desperately trying to enter the room. At first she thought it was her friend, so she yelled, Come in! Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiations piercing through. The knob just kept turning. They were shaking it as well, so she yelled again, Come on in! She thought how rude it was of them to act like this. It was then when she realized her friend couldn't be there, as she was putting her clothes back on, and there was no way she already had. She explicitly told me, that she had the feeling that nobody would be behind the door when she opened it. So that was it. She quickly opened it, and sure enough, nobody was there. There have been a couple more incidents around that room too. For example, one night there were two doctors with my mom, when suddenly, one of her co-workers witnessed an ecography gel bottle flying at extreme speeds against a wall. There was nobody there just the three of them. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit too cliche-like, maybe because I'm not experienced, but I can assure you that she didn't make this up. One of her co-workers says that there's something wrong with that floor as well. I really don't know what to think. A few years ago, I was a CNA, Certified Nursing Assistant, 
and I worked at a nursing home. I had a few encounters there, but nothing prepared me for everything that would happen when I started working at a hospice home. It's essentially where people go to die, people that are very sick and don't have a lot of time. The facility was amazing and worked quickly on getting people in. The point is a lot, and I mean a lot of people passed away in the building and a lot when I was working, which was from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. I always opened the window in the resident's room after someone passed away, my way of feeling like the spirit wouldn't be trapped. No one else did this, unfortunately. On to the main point of the story. We have two wings of the building, and each wing has a huge linen closet, Tons of sheets, blankets, comforters, towels, washcloths, gowns, you name it. When you open the door, both walls are lined with racks filled with linen. You can walk down into the room a couple hundred feet and then turn to the right and it's a little area where extra stuff is stored. Things for the bed baths and hygiene things for the residents. You are completely hidden when you're in the area on the right. A resident woke up around midnight and wanted to get cleaned up, so I was going to give them a bed bath. I went into the linen closet and headed to the area on the right. I was grabbing some soap, toothbrush, toothpaste, a little basin, and other things. And that's when I heard the closet door open and close. We have one CNA and one RN, registered nurse, on each wing during the night shift. I figured it was the nurse or the CNA for the other side. Sometimes we grab each other if we need help. I then heard a female voice say, Hello? I said, I'm just grabbing stuff for a bath. Do you need help? I figured it was a nurse. I hear, I'm so cold. I can bring you a blanket, I said. Maybe I'll throw it in the dryer again like last week. I laughed. I turned around and headed to walk back down the main area of the linen closet, and nobody was there. I didn't hear the door open again, so no one left, and there's no place to hide. I then feel someone grab my shoulder. I scream and drop everything as I turn around so quickly, but no one's there. I ran out of there so fast. I tried to tell the nurse what was happening, but I wasn't making any sense until I calmed down. She stuck by my side the rest of the night, and I didn't go back into the linen closet that night. When they grabbed me, it felt like it touched my bare skin, and it was so cold. This was one instance of so many encounters that I experienced there. Here's a bit of background. I lived my whole life in Southeast Michigan. I was born in the late 80s and came of age in a time of Hocus Pocus, Casper, Now and Then, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and The Craft. It was the time of girl power and girls with powers, am I right? In the early to mid 90s, us kids without cable TV were limited to primetime network television specials that were sometimes magic shows. I don't remember exact details, but it surely got my attention, especially the participate at home, touch your TV screen parts. I think a lot of people my age had a somewhat harmless and whimsical relationship with the occult pre-Y2K. I went to public school in a middle class area, and I remember that in second or third grade, debunking magic was actually part of our curriculum. There was a whole chapter in our reading and writing textbook. It defined magic as clever tricks and broke down magic tricks step by step. This I do remember vividly because it was so bizarre. Needless to say, it introduced my class to Harry Houdini. I was either in my last year of elementary or my first year of middle school. So my ghost story takes place Halloween night in 1997 or 1998. My best friend had an early November birthday and talked her mom into celebrating with a trick-or-treat and then sleepover birthday party. There were probably 10 to 15 girls, including me. 
After returning from trick-or-treating, we ran downstairs to their finished basement and dumped all of the candy and started doing the normal preteen girl things. I'm sure there was truth or dare and cooties catchers and nail polish involved. She had one of those little TVs with the VCR built in, and I'm sure there was a movie on that nobody was watching. At some point, probably around 8 or 9 p.m., a girl suggested contacting spirits and nobody objected. My best friend went into the laundry room and started digging through holiday decorations looking for candles. She came back with her arms full of random candlesticks, tea lights, three wick candles, and a lighter. All the candles were lit and pushed close together. We turned off all the lights and the TV and we sat in a circle. Someone suggested that we contact Harry Houdini, since he died in Detroit on Halloween. And we were in proximity to Detroit, and it was Halloween. Kid logic. Our seance was a joke. It was just ten-plus girls talking over each other, applying our bumbling pop culture knowledge. Most of the girls got bored, turned on some lights, and started playing light as a feather, stiff as a board on the other side of the basement to keep the spooky vibe alive. Another girl and I, I don't really remember her, stayed with the candles. We sat next to each other and I did all the talking. I basically told Mr. Houdini that I knew he was here with us and to prove it. All the candles were still lit with their flames pointing straight up. In school around this time, we had started learning about geometry. At some point, I asked Houdini to make a candle to a 360 degrees. Remember, all the candles are pushed together. Well, it started to get really cold. It wasn't just like the feeling of your blood running cold when you're scared. It felt like standing outside in the cold on a windless day. We could see our breath and the cold made us focus on the candles. One, just one of the candle flames, not the wick, slowly pointed down the wick and was burning perpendicular, like the flame was sideways like the pointy top of the flame was pointing to the left like an arrow. The sideways flame then started slowly moving around the wick like a ticking clock hand. When the flame made it all the way around the candle, it extinguished itself, not disturbing any of the other lit candles. I remember the other girl and I looking at each other. I was horrified and she was calm. She shook her head and put her finger to her mouth like a shh motion and blew out the rest of the candles. We stood up and joined the rest of the party and never talked about it again. This experience creeped me out so much that I didn't even talk about it until my late 20s. I do not believe that we contacted Harry Houdini, probably some friendly Halloween loving spirit that felt generous enough to grace the two of us with a genuine paranormal experience. At least, that's what I hope it was. I was working out and I was on the phone with my dad and we were having a nice conversation. Then I heard this devilish scream it literally sounded like some kind of demon or devil was screaming in my room. I heard it echo through my dad's line too, but he told me that he couldn't hear a thing. I was confused. I said, what do you mean you didn't hear it? And he said, I just didn't hear it. My stomach dropped, so I took out the butcher knife and started walking to my room. I know, stupid idea. I probably should have just ran out of the house until somebody came back but I did what I could. And keep in mind, I was home alone and nobody could have saved me if something had come and popped up on me. I searched the room and there was absolutely nothing. I searched the other rooms as well. Still nothing. I'm totally confused as to what happened. If anybody does know, please tell me because as of right now, I'm never entering that room again until I know what that was.
A few friends and I decided to book a small getaway up north for a week or so. We settled on a lovely converted church in the middle of nowhere, next to a small river near the sea. After a couple hours of driving to the place, we finally arrived and were faced with a small converted old church. It was beautiful, and we were sure we were going to have a great time. We opened the door and started to settle in. There was a log stove in the corner, and with it being September in Scotland, it was kind of chilly. I made sure that it was lit consistently. We cracked open some drinks and put on some music. Iron Maiden, number of the beast to be exact, but we never thought of the connection to the church. So we had our drinks and a great night. I had fallen asleep on the sofa, and I woke up through the night, but had this strange feeling of somebody watching me. I shrugged it off, thinking that it was just because of the strange surroundings, and that I was probably just uncomfortable in a new place. The next morning I woke up and decided to do all the dishes. While I was washing up, my friend came through and sat on the sofa. I had a dinner plate and a side plate in my hands and turned around to put them on the counter. As I turned away, I saw the plates slide along the counter and nearly fall off. As you would expect, I grabbed them, but as I did, I felt some kind of energy push back at me. It was the weirdest feeling, kind of like being electrocuted but without the pain. I dropped the plates and stepped back in panic as my friend said, Are you okay? I just said, Yeah, I'm fine. Because I didn't want to seem silly. What I realized, though, after it happened, was that I was wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. Most of the things that happened seemed to happen in connection with that band or something similar. My other friend came through then and remarked how cold it was in the room, which was strange because, as I mentioned before, I had the log burner stove going all the time. Again, I said nothing. A few days passed, and on the last night, my friend was tidying up as we were all in bed. We heard footsteps upstairs, but we thought it was just him, until we realized that he was washing dishes and hadn't been upstairs all night. It was a crazy week, and some other things happened, but those were the most serious. Back in 2018, I met a sweet girl at my church. I'm going to call her Lily for the sake of this story, as I don't want to reveal her personal information. We became pretty good friends. We would sit with each other or nearby every service. We attended canned food drives to help others around Thanksgiving. And we sat together with a few older couples at church during lunches. But outside of being close church friends, we weren't really that close outside of that context. At one point, we had each other's Snapchats before I deleted it. The week before my birthday, I went to church as normal, ate breakfast with another friend of mine and her kids, and I made my way to the sanctuary. I saw Lily sitting on the right-hand side of the aisle, and I sat next to her. We talked for a bit, and then service began. However, halfway through, she got a phone call and left the church. She didn't come back, so I figured that maybe she had a family emergency or had to go to work early. I finished up at church, talked to my pastor and his family, and I headed home to give a couple piano lessons. Nothing else odd or weird crossed my mind, though. I just carried on with my week until next Sunday. The following Sunday was my birthday. I was excited because it was my golden birthday, the year of 25. I don't usually like celebrating my birthday, but this was going to be a good one. I'm a newlywed, spending the day with my husband, having my favorite coconut cream pie instead of cake. I still wanted to go to church that morning, though. I love my church and church family and spending time with them. From the minute the church doors opened, everything was off. I walked down to the basement and had a cup of cold coffee, a bagel, 
and I noticed a few people around me were just pale, cold. I can't even properly describe the sadness on their faces. I'm a pretty introverted person, so I didn't ask any questions. I just went back upstairs to the sanctuary and waited for the service to start. My pastor walked up to the podium with tears in his eyes. He began to tell us about how there was a tragedy within the church. Lily had taken her own life the weekend prior, Friday night to be specific. I started crying uncontrollably. I had no idea she was dealing with that, and I felt like an awful friend. We had a beautiful service dedicated to her before her funeral. We all sang songs that she loved, prayed for her mother and family, and prayed for her. I left right after church, and I went straight home. I didn't think about the details of her death because it was just too much. A few hours later, though, I remembered, the Sunday before, I saw her at church. How is that possible, though? She passed away Friday night, but I somehow saw her on Sunday. I sat right next to her. I had a conversation with her before services. I watched her answer her phone and walk out. I became angry, scared, disappointed, depressed. Every emotion that comes with losing a friend at such a young age. I fell into a hole. After I had grieved and prayed for a couple of days, something came to me. My church does live streams, and there would be a clear view of our service and us sitting next to each other. I logged on to my Facebook, found my church's page, and started searching for the date that I had last seen her. The strangest part of everything is that every live stream is in chronological order, so I figured it would be pretty easy to find. But to this day, I still haven't found it. I asked the person in charge of recording and uploading the sermons on Facebook where it was, and he said that somehow there were technical difficulties that day, and they were unable to stream the service or even capture any of the audio. I've racked my brain for months. To this day, I feel as if she was at church Sunday to say goodbye to me. I asked other members if they had seen her the week before, and all have said that they couldn't remember if they had, or they'll just correct me, saying, Honey, she passed away last Friday night. There's no way she would have been here. My church is fairly small, and we only have a morning Sunday service, so there's no possible way that I could have gotten the days mixed up. I've had many ghost encounters in my life, way too many to count. But this one hits the hardest. I wish I had more answers than I do, or some kind of proof, but I don't. I didn't have any eerie feeling when I last talked to her. She didn't feel like a ghost or an apparition. It felt like every other time, like she was really there, without a doubt. I hope that one day I can find some answers an explanation of some sort. But for now, I have to keep telling myself that this is how Lily decided to say goodbye to me, and I have to learn to be okay with that. My friend is a church custodian, and he's told me a lot of paranormal stories. While I was talking to him about an experience we had, I realized that I had seen an embodiment of one of the spirits from our church, something I had previously thought that I hadn't experienced. I saw it when I was very young, so I never put it together, until I was talking to my friend about something he had seen. He was talking about the time we'd been lured into the church by a dark figure in the window, which proceeded to lead us on a wild goose chase through the church. He described the figure he had seen as an average-sized male with no features, just all black. After hearing this, I remembered a time where I was waiting on my parents, who were talking to some people after evening service. Mostly everybody had gone home at this point, and the lights were all turned off on every floor except the ground floor. Being the adventurous little kid I was, and not really believing in ghosts at the time, I decided to go to the third floor, with all the lights off. As I rounded the steps to the third floor, 
I saw, thanks to the light in the parking lot coming through the window, the silhouette of an all-black man. The entire shadow was black, and I couldn't make out any features. I immediately ran back to my parents and told them, but as any good Baptist parents would do, they told me it was just somebody from the church. This occurred in the same spot that my friend said he had seen the figure. So, my church is haunted, but there are areas that one might consider a hot spot. These areas are the first floor men's bathroom, the bridal room, and the baptistry, which is connected to the third floor bathrooms. After years of being the custodian's son and part-time custodian, my friend has experienced pretty much all the notable spirits and ghosts that are in the church. One of these spirits is little more than a mild inconvenience, due to the fact that it likes to throw a wet paper towel into an otherwise clean hallway. My friend had told me about this spirit's antics before the story I'm about to tell you occurred. My friend and I were around 16 when this happened. My friend was playing basketball with two other friends from church one day during summer break. This was midday, so there was no one else at the church, and the church remained locked until we decided to go in. Being the custodian's son, my friend had the key. While taking a break from playing, all three of my friends swore that they saw the blinds in one of the windows on the third floor move like someone had brushed their hand from top to bottom. Me, not being a big basketball person, was not at the church to witness this part. Immediately after they saw the blinds move, they called me to tell me that they were going to go inside to investigate if I would be interested in joining them. I was. I arrived a few minutes later and went inside. Obviously, being an old building, the church has a tendency to make noises, but some of these were very distinguishable footsteps. One of my buddies put his phone on the voice recorder and he sits it in the first pew of the sanctuary while we're wandering about the rest of the building, hoping to record some of the noises we keep hearing. We place the phone down and head to the third floor. Nothing paranormal occurs on our first pass, but for some reason we decide to take the exact same path we had just taken over and over. On our second go-round is when we noticed something strange. There's a broom propped up in the doorway of the men's bathroom on the third floor. This broom was without a doubt not there on our first pass. We don't think much of this until our third trek, which is when we notice that the broom is still in the doorway, but in a different position. The thing about it was that the broom had not slid out at the bottom, but had been stood up. We continued on this path maybe three to four more times, each time the broom had been moved to a different position in the same doorway. We decided that it's been long enough, so we go to check on the phone that my buddy had put in the sanctuary. We all go in and begin listening to the recording, when we finally realized how stupid of an idea it was, because there was no way to tell what was us and what wasn't. That is, until we hear a loud tap that was coming from just a few pews behind the phone. The tapping gets closer, and then one more tap even closer. Finally, we hear a triple tap on the screen of the phone. After listening to the recording, we decided to check on the broom one more time. As we reached the third floor, there are two very obvious things that have changed. One, the broom is now in a different doorway altogether, and two, there's a wet paper towel laying in the middle of the hallway in front of the men's restroom. My friend claims to have seen a reflection that wasn't ours in the window across the hall from us, and that's when we decided that we were done ghost hunting for the day. A couple of years later, one of my buddies is helping his dad, who's a plumber, renovate one of the bathrooms in the church. As they're headed to the bathroom, my buddy spots a familiar sight in the middle of the hallway is a wet paper towel. I 
write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. 
thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in old house, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I've never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. For a short period of time, my ex and I lived at his late grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a little drably dressed old man, about one and a half feet tall, run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in, and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I'd already been through, when he asked me what happened, I just told him I'd slipped. Another thing I once saw may have been a troll, but I'm not sure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you can enlighten me. I had been doing a lot of meditating, three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was this three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf type troll thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I've had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I have seen them as well. Once in childhood, I had an encounter with my late Noni, and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways, and nothing has ever been found other than some white spots from chronic migraines, and those popped up super recently. 
I've also been evaluated by a neuropsychologist and nothing other than my seizures, due to the head trauma, has ever been wrong with me. Like I said, the head trauma happened way after I saw the troll or gnome or whatever it was. I don't know what these things are, but what do you think?